Okay, let's get started. Thank you everyone for joining us. Welcome to the sixth webinar in the seven part series entitled Understanding Trauma, Unpacking a Culturally Responsive Approach to Serving Sexual Assault Survivors During COVID-19. My name is Erica Blackwood and I am the SADI Specialist for NCCASA. Our focus is on helping advocates to create accessible, culturally responsive, and trauma-informed approaches to the unique needs survivors are facing during the dual pandemics. Before we get started with today's webinar, Do No Harm, How RCCs Can Work to Support Survivors' Trauma Responses, just a few housekeeping items. All webinars are recorded and available on NCCASA's YouTube page afterwards. Certificates will be available at the end of the series, and our training specialist, Gabriella Nyman, will be handling distribution. If you have any questions, you can use the chat box, fe chat box feature to ask a question for all, privately to panelists, or use the Q&A feature. Please be mindful of taking care of yourself first. I am so thankful that all of you are joining us today, but we understand this moment of active trauma and heightened anxiety. If you need to step away, please do so. Or if you need some additional assistance, you can message panelists privately. And now I introduce to you the host of today's webinar, NCCASA's own Prevention Education Program Manager, Christy Perrault. Turning it over to you, Christy. Thank you. Thanks, Erica. Hi, everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. If there's any challenges with the audio, let me know in the um, chat box, and I'll adjust on my end. Um, I can tell you, as you know, NCCASA is a statewide coalition that uses a social justice framework. We are working using advocacy and education and legislation to uh, shift the needle in North Carolina. We organize and sponsor statewide trainings and support rape crisis centers, many of whom are also dual agencies. As you know, we do human trafficking, outreach and prevention education, and college and campus work. We have a, a pretty powerful staff with a lot of wisdom and insight, and so almost anything you might want to do in your program, you can reach out and we can support you in that work. We acknowledge as we move through this work that not all women are victims, not all of the people we work with are um, victims, and not all men are perpetrators, and anyone of any gender can be a victim or a perpetrator. Today we're going to be talking uh, about doing no harm, so digging in a little bit more into trauma-informed care. Um, I can tell you that we are going to be talking about sexual violence today and um, some of the ways that intersects with our other identities. And as Erica mentioned, today is, is a really tricky day for a lot of us. Um, and I'm, I'm just so grateful that you're here joining us today. And I, I wanted to tell you that as I was preparing today's webinar, I did keep in mind some of that extra stress and uncertainty that each of us is carrying right now. So um, we are going to be um, shifting our focus from what this webinar might have been on any other day to make sure we're um, having space for us and where we are right now. Um, there is going to be um, some content warnings around just general election stress, and we are going to talk some at the end about how that intersects with some of these other kinds of um, trauma and stress people are feeling right now. So. This kitten is super cuddly and cozy because we want to remind you to take care of yourself. Um, and that might look like stepping out of the room and it might, again, like Erica mentioned, mean messaging the panelists privately so we can change the pacing or address any concerns you might be having. And because we're probably all carrying some extra stress right now, um, just take a moment before we dig into this and ground in the purpose of why we're here, which is that we want to learn better ways of working with and caring for survivors of trauma who come into our agencies and who call our hotlines and who trust us to be part of walking their journey of healing with them. We want to learn better how to hold that trauma with, um, with a, a sacred acknowledgement of what they've been through and what they're um, learning and how they're growing and where they want to be. Um, so we ground in that purpose, recognizing that as we learn more about how to provide trauma from people 
from a variety of backgrounds that may be similar to our own in some ways and are likely going to be different from our own in some ways, that, that we can provide more and more supportive services. Um, one of the things I noticed as I was preparing the slide is that when you're first getting into learning what trauma-informed care looks like, it feels a little bit like a protocol or a checklist or a method or things that you do, but the more you do it, the more it becomes normalized and just becomes the way you engage in this work without having to think about the checklist quite as much. So that's why we're here today is to continue building our skill set and our self-reflections around how we work with survivors so that we can continue to make that level of um, acceptance and um, generosity of spirit our everyday way of being with the survivors who come through our doors. So this is me, my name is Christy and my pronouns are they, them, and I am currently the Prevention Education Program Manager at NC CASA. Before that, I was our anti-human trafficking specialist. And before that, I did a decade at a local rape crisis center um, doing direct services, hotlines, hospital accompaniment, court accompaniment, legal accompaniment, and leading support groups. And so while my current job is prevention focused, I have a, a strong background in um, working directly with survivors. And so I'm excited to be able to join with you today to talk about this topic because it's one that's very meaningful to me um, personally and as someone who's had a decade doing direct service. And it's also um, a change of pace for me to get to talk about different pieces of our rape crisis work. So thank you for having me. And so we have a few polls. And so our first poll that I think Gabrielle is going to put up for us is how long have you been working with survivors of trauma? And um, once we have that, maybe Gabrielle, if you're not able to post or make them visible, if you could maybe give us some of the, the breakdown, either verbally or in the chat box, that would be so helpful. Yeah, of course, I'll post in both. So we have a few more people that need to vote. So I'm going to go ahead and give another 30 seconds. All right, so it looks like 14% of you said under a year, 36% said one to five years, and 50% of you said five plus years. Wow, we have some, some, some uh, long timers here. That's amazing. So our next question is, how confident are you in providing trauma-informed care to people from marginalized populations? So. Um, we know that a lot of people feel pretty confident with the basic ideas of trauma-informed care, but I'm specifically wondering how do you, how would you assess your, your own confidence around working with people from a variety of backgrounds? All right, I'll give another 20 seconds to people. All right, it looks like 7% said not at all, 7% said sort of, 57% said moderately, 21% said very, and 7% said I could teach this course. Good job. All right. Okay, so that's a good spread across um, the answers. And the last poll that we had is how well do you feel, this is not your personal competency, but how well do you feel your agency does, your organization you work for, how well does your agency do with providing trauma-informed care to people from marginalized populations? All 
right, I'll give everyone another 20 seconds to vote. All right, so it looks like 0% said not at all, 29% said sort of, 36% said moderately, 21% very, and 14% said this is our specialty and we're great at it. Wonderful. So, okay, so we again have a, a good spread across the different levels of experience and confidence. Thank y'all for doing that for me. That's just to kind of help me sort of see where everyone is as we're going through this. So we're going to start with just thinking through a few scenarios and what might survivors need. We want to start thinking about what is it. I mean, you've done this series and y'all been doing a lot of work around understanding trauma and understanding how trauma impacts people, um, historical trauma. You've done a lot of work around that. So today we're going to start looking at, at what do we do with all of this information when we're working with survivors on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's imagine for a moment. Um, and I'm going to have you, as you start thinking of things, you can add them to the chat box. Uh, but imagine for a moment that you've been assaulted and your advocate shows up at the hospital. You're frightened. You're, um, you've been blaming yourself. You've spent your entire waiting time in the ER going back through all the details of the night. Was there something you should have noticed or something you could have done differently? You're embarrassed and you're cold and your stomach hurts from hunger, even um, though you know you probably couldn't get food down if you tried. So what do you need? What does a survivor need from your advocate right now? And what would help you feel safer in this moment? So those hospital visits when we go, what, is, what does a survivor need in that moment to feel safer? And we're obviously going to unpack some of the details of this around trauma-informed care over the course of the webinar, but just initial impressions. What do you think survivors in the hospital? Being told it wasn't your fault, um, receiving support. Um, I know that um, we, we calm, confident support. That is something that any of you who've ever done hospital accompaniment know is that like the way that you control your pacing when you're speaking to them, um, your tone of voice can kind of help set a tone that they will pick up on sometimes and that can help with the calming when they're feeling a little bit disjointed. Support and listening to them, so um, being there to listen non-judgmentally. Affirmation, so reminding them that this isn't their fault and that they could, you know, that, that all of this going back through what you've went through is a normal response. Um, someone says information on what to expect through the process, so letting them know here's what the protocols are of what's going to happen tonight and at this point you can expect this. Um, that's good, letting people know what's coming. Clean, warm clothes. We can never forget the importance of some of those physical needs, um, let's see, so, so clean, warm clothes if needed, um, understanding patients to be believed, um, someone else mentioned to be believed, answering questions that they may have in that moment, um, and again, remembering the physical needs that just asking, you know, I know you mentioned that you're hungry, would you like me to go see if I can round up a pack of crackers, because a lot of times, the survivor might be nervous to ask um, when the nurse is in the room because there's so many people coming in and out and so many things to think about and it can be overwhelming. Um, and so that's a good time when you as an advocate can ask and if they say yes, then you can let the nurse know, hey, can we get a, you know, a snack, some crackers, something like that. These are all really good answers. Thanks, y'all. So a second scenario, you're a survivor of trauma, but it happened years ago. And you thought you were over it and you'd moved on, but for the past few weeks, you've been reading on social media about a beloved religious leader who was accused by several people of sexual abuse. Reading all the comments online has been bringing up a lot of memories and feelings, and so after your kids went to bed, you spent an entire hour online Googling the person who hurt you. You find out they died last year, leaving behind a spouse and kids of their own. 
On their online obituary page, you find dozens of tributes from friends and family grieving the loss of a dear friend, loving parent, and commenting on how the world is a little less bright without their radiance in it. You are overwhelmed, and you look up your local hotline, and you call. So here's someone whose trauma was was years ago who's having it kicked back up by some recent things and finding out about the death of their um, abuser. So what do you think this caller needs from their advocate right now, and what would help them feel safer in this moment? Some grounding techniques. I'm so glad you brought that up. Grounding techniques can be really helpful if you ask if they're interested in that, you know, helping them talk through how, when these overwhelming feelings come up, what are some things you can do to feel grounded again and to feel uh, a little more secure in what's happening? Um, listening to them is um, something that a few people have mentioned, someone listening as they process emotions and giving them space to talk through it can all be really helpful. In addition to those, you're going to want to do things like just helping normalize the feelings because one of the things that can happen is judging yourself for having the feelings that you're having. Is it, it maybe I'm feeling sad to find out that they died. And then I'm like, how can I be sad about this person that hurt me? So being like, that's a normal response. Sometimes we have, I mean, we still have feelings when these things happen. Or maybe they find out this person died and they're glad. And they're like, why do I feel glad about this? Why do I feel relieved? Am I a bad person? So kind of like validating whatever you're feeling in this moment, this is a response. You went through a whole lot and it's normal that you might have a variety of responses. Um, our very last scenario, just to kind of get us thinking about what people need to feel safe, but our last scenario, you're coming in for your first night of an eight-week support group for survivors of sexual assault. You walk into the room and fix a cup of coffee and make your way to an open chair. There are a few other people in the room, and two of them are making awkward small talk about a TV show you've never watched. The facilitator walks in the room, and you start to feel a little bit panicky. You've never done this before, never talked about your assault in front of other people, and you're nervous. What do you need from your facilitator right now and what would help you feel safer in this moment? First time in a support group and you've never been in a support group, you've never talked about your trauma history in front of people, you're, you're nervous. So someone is saying we would want someone to help normalize and understand the feelings that you might be happening. Having a welcome and reassurance that you're not alone. Having the facilitator give intros and welcome and explain that it's okay to feel nervous right now. Um, a lot of this you'll notice is reassuring people that the feelings that you're having in this moment are okay. Because um, I don't know if y'all have ever had this experience, but I do this myself to where my feeling is like maybe a four out of 10 in terms of how I'm feeling about it. But my judgment of my feeling will be about an 8 out of 10. And I'm like, why am I having this feeling right now? And so sometimes that reassurance that the feelings are okay and normal can take away some of that shame or judgment about the feelings that you're having. Um, ooh, I like that someone brought up in the um, comments if they would let me listen first and then engage. So Yes, if this is your first week in a support group, you definitely don't want to have the support group facilitator dive in with the most vulnerable sharing activity of the entire series. <laughs> That's a good time to start with just like letting them listen and then letting them engage as they want. Um, those of you who um, are NCCASA members can go to our website. Any of you can go to our website. We have a document that our prevention um, team put out over the summer called Emergent Space that gets into a little bit of um, practical ideas for building that sense of safety in the beginning. So thank you for giving me some ideas um, on all of these and how you might meet survivors where they are to provide support. We're going to talk some today about trauma-informed care. And there's a lot of fancy definitions of what trauma-informed care means. And there's some principles we're going to cover later in the workshop. but. But the key behind trauma-informed care is that it's a way that you start from a place of assuming and accounting for and being gentle with the fact that the people you're working with have may have trauma. 
And so we start from a place of kind of moving slowly and at a pacing that's less likely to feel overwhelming for a trauma survivor. And we move forward in that gentle and thoughtful way rather than just kind of like moving on along at a nice little clip and then pausing when someone feels overwhelmed. So imagine that you are, um, I mean, I don't know, maybe you've all had this experience, whether it was in your work or just in your everyday life of having a conversation with someone that maybe you didn't notice in that moment that they were getting overwhelmed. So you're still just prattling along like like you think you're having a nice intellectual conversation and then you notice that they look like they're checking out a little bit. And at that point, you've already tripped something up in them. And so um, you can pull back if that happens in a support group or on a crisis call and go a little bit slower and make repair and it's still definitely um, possible to keep keep the process going. However, sometimes if you plan ahead, you can avoid some of those um, trip ups, even if not all of them. So that's what trauma informed care is about is with with the understanding that we can't anticipate all of the trauma triggers that someone might have, we try to anticipate some so that we're setting it up in a way that's less likely to, to trigger those responses in people. The principles of trauma-informed care are safety, trustworthiness and transparency, peer support, collaboration and mutuality, empowerment, voice and choice, cultural, historical and gender sensitivity. And so again, we're remembering that while we try to do all of those six principles in the way we do our work, that each person is going to be a little bit different. And so unique people have unique traumas, and that means they're going to have unique triggers. So if you um, do your best to plan for trauma-informed care and you're really thinking through your processes for not, uh, unintent not um, you know, unnecessarily tripping someone's anxiety up and then it happens anyway, that's okay. Like we, we do this work the best we can and not everybody is um, – not everybody's going to react the same way to the same content. So um, if we start to think about each of those principles in practice, we start with thinking about safety and what the things that we can do are that create a sense of safety. So thinking of some of the basic services that a lot of our rape crisis centers um, provide, we have, you might have someone who's a walk-in, you might have appointments, you might have hotlines support groups, maybe you provide hospital support or court and legal or law enforcement accompaniment. And then you also want to think about your physical space. So what are some of, thing, some of the things you can do, um, perhaps even just with your physical space, for those who are coming in for appointments or walk-ins to create a sense of safety? What are some things you do that create safety? I know there's the obvious that if you have a shelter, we typically keep that location private so that people can't show up who aren't expected. Sometimes offering confidentiality, and y'all can feel free to, to answer some of your thoughts in the chat box. Sometimes offering confidentiality policies and stating those up front can create a sense of safety. Uh, because people are going to feel more safe sharing what they want to share and what they need to share in that moment if they know that it's not going to be told or reshared to someone else. Someone mentioned locking the doors. Okay. And then thinking about hotlines and support groups and all the other places where people are engaging with you, what helps create a sense of safety? And we're thinking physical safety here, but you also want to think like emotional safety. Um, someone mentioned having panic buttons hidden under every desk and having supportive posters in their space. So there we're looking at something that's talking about a, a way to protect for physical safety, which is a panic button, and then also supportive posters to create that sense of emotional safety in that space. Having your space marked as a safe zone, and so looking at those safe zone trainings where you can show that you're there to be a safe, supportive person for people with marginalized identities. Um, someone mentioned offering tech support can create a sense of safety. And Patricia, I could be um, misunderstanding that, but I'm, I'm, my thinking when I read that was how sometimes talking on the phone can feel overwhelming. So having some tech support can create both an emotional sense of safety and physical safety if there's someone nearby that they can't talk in front of. Okay, making sure I understood that. So tech support can create a sense of safety. Group agreements in a support group can create a sense of safety. 
um, that's another thing that can build that sense of safety. Because we have to remember when you've survived trauma, and I know you've probably talked about this on the other webinars, that sometimes you can have trauma responses to a situation that's safe in this moment, but because it trips up an old memory or an old feeling or an old nervous system response in your body, you feel unsafe in that moment. So you're going to want to do things that create that emotional sense of safety and, and makes your center feel like a place of rest where they don't have to have their nervous system on high alert in those moments. Judgment-free zones. We're not judging you. That's a good thing someone put in the chat. In the judgment-free zone. We're not judging you. We're not blaming you. Whatever you come in here with carrying, we're still going to support you. Um, we're not going to blame you. So these are all things that help create safety. When we think about working with people from um, marginalized backgrounds, we want to think about the fact that what you think of as safety may or may not be the same way someone else thinks about safety. And so you can have ideas about what might be safer or less safe. But ultimately what it comes down to is what that survivor thinks is the safest choice for them out of the options that they have available in that moment. And we know that safety happens in a few different ways. So there's safety in our community or neighborhood, and that's where we're looking at, do I feel like my community supports me? Do I feel like my community values my humanity and, and supports my right to safety and my bodily autonomy? Um, do, do I feel like my community and my neighborhood support my freedom? We also can look at safety in relationships. Um, does my, and we can think intimate partner relationships, we can think family members, parents, siblings, teachers, classrooms, and never forget that the relationship they have with you is also a relationship that they need to find that safety in. So um, a lot of times we get so focused on assessing whether or not they feel safe with a partner, for example, or um, with, you know, um, a court system that we forget that you're another person that they're having to interact with in this moment and feeling very vulnerable with. So thinking through ways how to build safety in your relationship with them. And again, we mentioned that those trauma responses are in the body, that that activation of your nervous system uh, can be a trauma response. It's not in your control. It can just, there'll be a, a memory or um, a, like a body memory that triggers a trauma response in you where your palms are sweaty and maybe your breathing changes and you're feeling that sense of panic. And so there are things that people can do that create um, a greater sense of safety in the body. And those things are, are kind of informed by the neuroscience of what relaxation feels like and how it happens. Um, as you're thinking of these things, how might this be different for transgender survivors or for lesbian, gay, and bisexual survivors uh, who may be cisgender, for undocumented survivors, for black or indigenous survivors. Um, so looking through these, you may feel like you live in a safe neighborhood. Uh, someone else might not. <laughs> you might feel like you can walk through the streets without being harassed. Uh, someone else might not. And, and when we look to studies to see how these um, people with different backgrounds experience the world and their communities, we typically find that they are statistically more likely to experience things like harassment, street harassment, violence, um, you know, and that includes partner violence and um, just random criminal violence and then also state violence. These people are, um, you know, people who have marginalized identities are more likely to experience uh, to have had negative or violent interactions with police where they're being harmed. Um, so keeping in mind that how you understand safety might look different. So if you have a survivor who um, has been sexually assaulted and is undocu an undocumented immigrant, and you're thinking that leaving that situation they're in, uh, changing some pieces in their life, reporting to, the, to law enforcement can create safety for them, they might be they might be weighing out what feels safe differently than you do because they know what their options are and those options are informed by how um, safe, how much access to safety do they have in their culture, in their community, in the neighborhood, in their relationship with you and also with other systems. Um, so keeping in mind that, that the survivor's perception of safety is what we're trying to build on here. 
So we think about trustworthiness and transparency. And I picked this picture um, because you can see the rows. Everything's clear. Everything's laid out. You can see where the one field starts and the other one ends. You can see where the horizon is. So you know where we're going if we walk in that direction. And the sky is really clear. You can see exactly what's up there. Um, so looking again at our services, our physical spaces, our hotlines, the ways we interact with survivors, what are the things we can do that create trustworthiness and transparency? So um, someone in our hospital example earlier mentioned a really good way to create trustworthiness and transparency, which is to let someone know what the process is going to be. And that could apply on hospital, court and legal, law enforcement being like, here's our process, here's what's going to happen next, here's the things we're going to do. If there's something you don't know what's going to happen, then you tell them that. I'm not sure what's going to happen when we get to this point in our process. Here's what will determine which way it goes giving them really good information, as much information as they want in that moment to feel secure. Um, that's the same with the walk-ins and your space, trustworthiness and transparency. If they can't even figure out how to get to, to you or to your office, that does not build a sense of trustworthiness. Allowing survivors in the chat box, we have allowing survivors to chart their own course and their, recov and their recovery and what steps they want to take. Absolutely, that's both building trustworthiness and transparency and empowering their voice. Um, being upfront with any restrictions on confidentiality before they share so they can decide what, if anything, to disclose. Yes, that is very important. I know when I did hotline work, we actually had it in our protocol to where we started every call with saying something to the effect of how I, I want to be here and, and talk to you more and hear more about why you called, but I wanted to let you know up front that everything you say is confidential unless you indicate um, harm to a child or plan to harm yourself or someone else. Did you have any questions about our confidentiality policy before we moved on? So kind of giving that to them in advance. Um, Oh, we have another good one in the chat, which is some of you have already been doing this. So when, when we call you, you let us know you're still working remotely and how long it will be before an advocate gets to me. So that's a very good thing. If we're working remotely, having it to where we're like, someone will respond to you within this amount of time and then doing your best to make sure that that happens. That helps them um, have some transparency so they aren't confused or not sure what's coming. Um, being transparent about your limitations. <laughs> I don't know if y'all have ever dealt with um, a survivor that you were working with who really was hoping that you could fix everything for them. And boy, when you're on the other end of that hotline or when you're working with sitting across from that survivor in your office, every single one of us, our hearts wish we could um, when they need that. Um, but being realistic about your limitations, being realistic and transparent with them about the limitations of the systems they're working in. We don't want to be feeding someone some dream about what's going to happen if they report or if they um, do a certain thing and then have them be disappointed when we could have prepared them more transparently for what the process might be like. Informing them of their options, someone says in the chat box. That is wonderful. That's another thing that you could do. These are your options, right? You choose. These are the options we have to offer. That also builds survivor um, choice and voice, which is another one of the principles of trauma-informed care. So when we think about why trustworthiness and transparency are especially important when we're working with a whole lot of people, we have this chart, and I just kind of want to bring it up. But this is an example of someone who's maybe experienced a whole lot of trauma in their life, right? So if we imagine that line in the middle, at the left of your screen is when they're born, and at the right of your screen is their timeline when they walk into your office. Over the course of their life, they may have had DV in their home when they were a kid. They may have witnessed a whole lot of home and family violence. There may have been substance use in their home or some form of abuse or neglect um, of the children when they were little. They could have spent their whole lives in poverty and had an incarcerated or absent parent. Maybe at some point they developed a substance use disorder, and maybe these red lines that are kind of splicing through that timeline at different points are a rape 
or um, some other traumatic experience, the death of someone close to them. And so they've had a whole lot of time, especially someone who's got complex trauma and has had a whole lot of traumatic experiences. They've had a whole lot of times in their lives when people have let them down and when systems have let them down and when people have told them it's going to be okay when it wasn't and when people have left them who said they were going to stay. And so you being trustworthy and transparent does a lot of things for them. First, it helps them work with you in a way that they can, um, that you can serve them as a client, that you can support them and be clear with them. And they'll want to keep coming to your agency to keep having contact with you and keep learning um, uh, about their options with you. But beyond that, you're being trustworthy and transparent can also begin to rebuild their ability to trust again. Like you get to model for them, this is what a trustworthy, healthy, honest and transparent relationship looks like. Because again, that relationship that you have with the client is a relationship. And especially if they haven't had a whole lot of people in their lives that they've felt were as trustworthy and transparent as they could be, you modeling that can be really transformative for someone. Even modeling when you get it wrong. So being trustworthy and transparent doesn't mean you're always gonna get it right. But part of that trustworthiness and transparency, if you get it wrong, if something happened that you didn't have time to prepare that survivor for, part of that trustworthiness can say, you know, this didn't turn out the way I wanted it, and I am so sorry. I'm so sorry that I didn't think to prepare you for this thing. You know, like owning some of those um, missteps that even if it wasn't in your control, being able to acknowledge that as a survivor, boy, this must have felt bad because that seemed like it was unexpected. Um, these are things you can do to rebuild trustworthiness and transparency with survivors. So we want to incorporate as much as we can peer support. And so again, thinking of your center as a whole and all the different kinds of work we do, what are some areas where you think you can bring in some peer support? And I, I want, while you're thinking of something to add in the chat box, I want to point out that I like this picture because it's not really someone who's a whole lot higher lifting someone up to their level, we don't have to be all the way at the top of the mountain to help someone climb with us. We can steady each other even when we're at about the same height. Um, so I like the idea that peer support doesn't mean that someone who's especially fancy and perfect and no longer impacted by any of their trauma is able to help you because then we would have no volunteers. Um, sorry to say, uh, I wouldn't be doing this work. Um, but peer support means that we support each other where we are. So what are some areas that you incorporate peer support in your programming? Yeah, so someone's mentioning that a, a benefit of this peer support is relatability. Who here wants to go share your most vulnerable, rough times in your life with someone who's never, who seems like they've never had a problem? <laughs> Not very many of us. So, so kind of uh, while we don't want to make their services about us and our experiences, letting, you know, being, being able to show up as your full self, uh, even if you're not a volunteer or another participant in a support group, your staff being able to show up as their full self and be human in your space can create um, some relatability, which also builds trust. Support groups are a way that we offer peer support. We know some of you are offering clinical or therapy groups. And we know that some of our centers offer volunteer support groups, and some of them do just like one-day workshops where people can come together and do art together um, while sharing. But I have heard so many times when I used to lead support groups at a center, this is the first time I've ever been around other people who've been through what I went through. And that was just transformative for me. There's something very um, lovely about the experience of being able to take off some of your armor because you know you're in a room with other people who dealt with it as well. And someone says, when you're willing to be vulnerable, I think that showing up as our full self in our work um, is vulnerability. And sometimes modeling that vulnerability can be very powerful. So um, thinking about peer support and a strength-based lens, um, those kind of tie together because again, peers have a whole lot to share and um, a whole lot of insight and when we have peer support, it reminds people you are not alone because experiencing trauma, especially complex or intense trauma, 
um, which again, we know isn't about the experience, it's about the person's reaction in their body to the trauma they're experiencing, can feel really isolating. It can feel so isolating. So these peer support options help people remember you're not alone. And then the other thing that happens in peer support is that you start to see people in these support groups who maybe are feeling down on themselves or like they lack confidence or maybe they're not feeling like they bring a lot of value to their community right now. And they get in this room together with other people who are feeling some of the same things and start to share and support each other. And all of a sudden, they're realizing that they do have a lot to offer in terms of support and connection. And that can be really powerful and confidence building and healing for the members of your support group. Another thing I would encourage you to do is expand your understandings of strengths-based approaches to include seeing knowledge that they gained in the wake of trauma as a strength in addition to the strengths that remain intact despite the trauma. What I mean by that is a lot of times when we talk about a strengths-based approach, we talk about helping them find strengths they still have in spite of experiencing trauma. And we're going to focus in on some of those inherent strengths that you have that the trauma didn't damage or take away from you. And what ends up happening is we fail to notice that sometimes those survivors, uh, it's never good that they experience trauma. It's never okay. We don't have to find a silver lining. I'm, that's not what I'm saying at all. But a lot of times in the process of recovering from trauma, survivors learn a whole lot while taking care of themselves and, and working on their healing. And so that um, that survivor may have learned things about commu about communication. They may have learned things about resilience. They may have learned things about community organizing when that was the only way they had to take care of themselves. Um, so remembering that strength space doesn't just mean the strength that your trauma didn't break, because that then suggests that this trauma somehow like defines who they are, but but looking at the strengths at, at their strengths in a holistic way, these are all the strengths you possess. And some of them may be inherent qualities, and some of them are things that I see how hard you work to create in your life. And that's amazing. This is a way you took care of yourself. This is a, a wonderful way you took care of yourself. Some of those ways we take care of ourselves, we take forward with us in our healing. And some of them, maybe we come to a place where we can set them aside because we don't need them anymore. Someone's mentioning in the chat box, a lot of times in these peer support strength-based models, when they see you being brave enough to be there with them, it can remind them that they can move on too. And that's really important. Thank you for sharing that. So the other another principle is collaboration and mutuality. And each of us has a piece that when we put it together, we can accomplish more than any one of us could alone. So think about your agency and the services you provide, the space you've set up. What do you do to provide um, opportunities for collaboration and mutuality with the survivors that you work with? One of the things I can think about is making sure that you're getting um, feedback from them regularly. I know that um, in our agency, at, even at NC CASA, we do um, evaluation of some of the, we're starting to do more evaluation of the TA we provide. We do evaluation of the programming we're doing. Those of you who've been, in, um, you know, when, when I did support groups, at the end of a support group, we would hand out a survey that had everyone give us feedback about what they liked, what they thought could be done differently. Um, what they learned um, in the support group about themselves. So getting feedback from them and then doing something with that feedback and making sure they know you're doing something with the feedback. We're not just getting this information so we can say we have it. We're getting, yes, someone mentioned doing surveys. We're not doing this survey just so you have something to do for the next five minutes. We're doing this survey because what you, what you say matters and we want to um, envision, you know, how we can improve our programming. Maybe an opportunity for collaboration would be involving um, survivors in an event that you're having. Um, you know, so if they want to get involved, but maybe maybe they want to volunteer. This is something that happens at rape crisis centers a lot. Someone wants to volunteer, but they don't feel like they're in a place where they can really do like hotline or support group work in this moment, but they might be really excited about helping you with a, a holiday banquet, for example. So finding ways they can collaborate and give what they're able to give because everybody wants to have that feeling of giving back in different ways. Someone mentioned follow-up intervals 
that's a really good a really good idea making it clear to them that we want to improve in any way that we can um, so these are opportunities for collaboration and mutuality and again that ties in with that empowerment and survivor voice even collaboration on their um, treatment plan if someone's coming up with a um, treatment plan with you that having them collaborate on coming up with options even on a hotline call so it sounds like here's some of the options that I've heard you just share with me. Am I right that I heard these three options? What do you think about those? Let's talk about it. So you're kind of helping them in, you know, it's a collaborative um, decision making, a collaborative brainstorming about the decision that they will be making um, so that it's not you saying, here's a service I think you need, right? So uh, around collaboration and mutua mutuality, I want to remind you all that we do want to minimize hierarchy. Um, and this is one of those to where if you think about it, who is the expert in the survivor's experience? The survivor, they're the expert in their own experience. Um, you may know a whole lot about sexual violence dynamics and a lot of the different ways that it can happen and a lot of the different services that are out there. We want an even playing field. Yes, someone brought that up in the chat box, an even playing field. You are not, so I, I chose this GIF and it's not moving. Oh, there it goes, now it's moving again. Nobody wants to receive guidance or emotional support from this person on my slide who's saying, well, actually, right? So don't be that person. Um, you're going to want to um, give them a chance to share their own expertise about their experience. One of the things that's happened is in the early days of the rape crisis movement, it was survivors taking care of survivors and very, very, very grassroots, and it wasn't professionalized. Um, and now a lot of agencies are moving more and more towards this professionalization of our field, which has brought a lot of strengths with it. We have a lot of um, social workers and trained counselors and people supporting us in this work who have so much knowledge and expertise, and that's wonderful. And also it's created a little bit of a hierarchical dynamic to where sometimes people feel like unless they have these degrees and these credentials, they don't have a lot to contribute to what you're doing. So. Um, remembering as you're talking to them, you're not more, um, you're not fancier than the survivor. You're wanting to, to level that playing field. We're valuable to them as professionals because we have knowledge and especially because we're trained to hold complexity and trauma with tenderness and intention. Not because we have all the answers. None of us are in this work because we have all the answers. Survivors don't come to us because we have all the answers. They come to us because they know we're able to hold complexity and um, attend to and hear and sit with them in their trauma in a way that other people in their lives can't, right? Um, how many of you have had the experience of, of working with a survivor who said, well, I tried talking about this to my, I don't know, parent, sibling, roommate, and all they were saying is how they're going to go beat somebody up for me and how I should do this and they're telling me what to do and it made me feel overwhelmed. So remember, they're not coming to us because we're super, super smart and have a whole lot of answers, even though a lot of us, you know, all of you on this call, we're all super, super smart, but they're coming to us because we're able to hold complexity and trauma in a way that the people in their lives can't, which is very healing and profoundly empowering. So empowerment, voice, and choice is another principle. So thinking through some of our um, some of our services that we provide. What are some ways that y'all see uh, your agencies and your work incorporating survivor empowerment voice and choice? And I can tell you even silly little things that you wouldn't think of, but like, um, uh, in a um, in your physical space, this is a goofy thing to mention. Um, but for um, some people, feeling like they can can empower themselves and move freely in their space can be really helpful. So maybe when if you have people coming for a support group, instead of you having to wait and bring everything, maybe you take the survivors and you're like, here's the coffee station at the back of the room. You're welcome to go and make yourself at home and fix a cup of coffee. For yourself. Um, so kind of making sure that they feel empowered to move through the space. 
giving the announcement at the beginning of the group that, hey, we're going to be doing our support group, but you can definitely excuse yourself at any time if, if you need to. Someone mentioned even doing potlucks as a way of um, empowering survivors and giving them choices, giving voice to the silence so I can say things that they can't now. Okay, that's definitely one way we can do that, um, is uh, finding out what, it, what messaging it is that they want us to say and making sure that we're supporting their, their um, voice and their empowerment and also helping build their confidence um, to feel like in our spaces they don't have to be silent. Um, giving them choices on the hotline that we don't tell them what to do. This is something that's really, really tricky because if you've ever worked with a survivor who made choices that you didn't think were the best choices that you would have made, it can be hard. If you're on the hotline call with a survivor who's having medical symptoms and you really want them to go to the hospital and you say, you know, I'm concerned about this, um, this symptom you mentioned. I'm a little concerned about your health and safety right now. Have you considered going to the hospital? And they immediately say, no, I, I can't go to the hospital right now. I can't. Then maybe you pause and, and pull, you know, pull back on that request for a bit and just kind of sit with it. And because sexual violence takes away someone's ability to make their own decisions. And we don't give them back the ability to make their own decisions by making their decisions for them. We give them back that empowerment and that sense of autonomy by helping them think through and plan for what they wanna to do to take care of themselves. Someone mentioned um, allowing them choice on where they sit in a space, asking them if it's okay if I take notes. That's wonderful. I know a lot of times I've worked with survivors of complex trauma who as soon as you pull out a pad and, and pencil are nervous because they don't know what you're doing. So. Um, asking them if it's okay, letting them know why you're taking notes would get back to transparency and trustworthiness. Um, introducing with pronouns can be a really good thing. Letting them know your pronouns and asking them if they want to share theirs can empower them. These are all really wonderful ideas. Thank you all for sharing. One thing I like to bring up around choice is this idea of the five domains of well-being. And it's by the Full Frame Initiative, and they have a toolkit, they have webinars, um, a lot more information. But I'm going to explain the basics of it to you and then tell you why it comes up for me with choice. So the idea is that there's these five areas in our lives that if each of us has access to, we experience a sense of well-being. And so that includes Social connectedness, do you have chances to interact and offer mutual support with people, um, connect with other humans? Stability, which basically means your, your ability to predict from one day to the next what's going to happen. That you, if you go to bed in one house tonight, you're pretty sure that's where you're going to be going to bed the next night unless you know now that you've been planning to move for a while. So stability, things are reasonably predictable from one moment to the next. Safety, and again, we unpacked safety earlier, so talking about the survivor's perception of safety. Mastery, which is where someone recognizes that there's a direct correlation between what they do and what they accomplish or receive. So mastery is being able to say, I um, put out job applications, eventually I get hired. I show up at work, I get paid, I, um, you know, follow the recipe and dinner is delicious, right? So that's mastery is, is being able to see a connection between what you do and what happens. And then the last one is meaningful access to relevant resources, which to me is one of the most power packed phrases I've ever heard in my life because a lot of times, if there's resources, sometimes the answer is there's just not resources available, this is a gap. But a lot of times we'll be like, there's resources for this, this person. They have resources. Well, are they meaningful? Um, what, what income level do they have to be at to qualify for the kind of support you need? Um, a lot of times the re restrictions put on things mean that it's not meaningful because they can't access it anyway. Um, relevant resources can also include things like culturally specific. If the resources that you're offering aren't relevant for their needs and their lived experiences, they're not going to access and use and benefit from those resources, right? So that's what the five domains are. Here's where it comes to, into choice, okay? Um, the idea is that sometimes people will sacrifice 
one or more of these in order to have access to the ones that they prioritize most highly. So let's say for a moment that a survivor, you're trying to help a survivor safety plan and you are focused on that box in the, right, the bottom right corner that says safety. You're like safety, safety, safety. How can we have safety for you? And you're like, here's your safety plan. Here's what we're going to do. And you, you work on a safety plan. And then the next time you talk to the survivor, they didn't follow your safety plan at all. Um, a lot of times, the response of the provider might be to think, why does this person not value their safety? I don't understand. When the reality might be that they know that in the safety plan you came up with, they would have to sacrifice one or more of these other ones to have access to that safety. And they can't sacrifice that right now, either because they physically can't or there's a financial restriction or they're just too scared to sacrifice this other thing. So let's imagine you safety plan with someone to, um, who's, um, who had been walking to work every day. And on their, their walk to work, they pass by um, their um, abuser's um, apartment, right? And so you come up with a plan for them to take a bus and go a different way to work. And maybe that, that bus that they get on, maybe their walk every day, they walked with a neighbor and that hour of social connectedness on their walk really meant a lot to them. Maybe the bus takes two hours longer than the walk does by the time they travel around town and wait for the bus stops and catch their transfer. Right, so be thinking about like what are they trading off? And so if you're aware that people want access to all of these and you're trying to help increase someone's safety, then you can be like, okay, how can we, how can we work on your safety with you in a way that helps keep these other four pieces in place as much as we can? Um, someone mentioned careers and reporting versus their career. Right, so if someone reports, they may end up facing retaliation. Right? Um, so maybe reporting is something that we think builds mastery because they report and they see that there's some sort of consequences. Or maybe reporting is how they access certain pools of funds, depending on what kind of violence they're experiencing. Um, so um, talking with them, we can be like, hey, is there any way that this safety plan we're working on is going to cause you to lose social connectedness? Like, go, go through and plan for these five domains of um, well being at the full frame initiatives. Page has a safety planning toolkit where it can teach you to take all of these domains of well-being into account as you're doing safety planning. So I bring that up in terms of survivor choice. And someone did mention in the chat box, we remember that their safety plan is not something we can plan. We need to see what they're comfortable with. Absolutely. And, um, and remembering this five domains model and using it in your safety planning can help you think through with them what kind of safety plan is actually going to work and be sustainable. It's kind of like setting up a budget. I don't know if any of you have ever set up a budget and you thought you were going to do great and you made it really, really tight and you were able to just like save so much money every month and your budget had such minimal amounts in each category. You were so proud of all the money you were going to save and then you go to implement it and you can't even, you can't even keep with it because it's too restrictive. Um, so five domains. Yes. Okay. So I see I'm not the only one who's done that before. Five domains kind of encourages you to think of safety planning similarly to where we're like, how can we make this sustainable? Because if we do like the tightest safety plan ever, where you never have to see the person who harmed you or their family or friends, um, and it takes away all these other things, you're not going to keep doing it. It's going to be useless, right? It's going to be a, a performative thing. Okay, so this picture, by the way, this is my cultural, historical, and gender sensitivity. This picture is my favorite thing I've ever seen at Halloween, which is um, someone on Facebook um, who her name, let's see if I can find out what her name was, was Nicole Monique um, Osmer. And she was a diversity picture for um, Halloween last year. And that was the best thing I've ever seen in my life. So the thinking is you want to have cultural, historical, and gender sensitivity but without it feeling like you're just trying to look like a diversity picture, right? So being culturally responsive and sensitive is more than just having diversity pictures in your brochures and on your website. It's actually about doing your internal equity work to make sure 
that you know what you're offering is going to be meaningful and relevant for people who are coming through their doors, that they're going to feel safe coming to you, that they're going to see staff who look like them and feel like them and have had similar experiences to them. So um, thinking through your services, what are some of the things that you do in your services or in your spaces to be culturally, historically, and gender sensitive? And I can share one, which is while y'all are typing in the chat box, I can share um, a thought that comes up for me. One that I thought was lovely was an agency we have who um, had their um, Latinx services coordinator. Instead of only having offices in their main office, that person kept office hours two days a week at a local um, community center for Latinx people. So you're going to spaces where, the, where it's their community center, and so you're not requiring people to come to you who may or may not feel like they have that sense of trust with your agency. They can go to the places that they trust and the agencies that they trust and still have access to good services um, from your agency specific to sexual violence. Um, so thinking about reporting again, reporting that for a lot of people, contact increased, increased contact with law enforcement or the criminal justice system may not feel safe. Uh, for a variety of reasons. And so being thoughtful about that. Um, I am reminded when I look at this um, of family justice centers. I have heard from a lot of um, people who are anxious to go to family justice centers because when they go there, there's police cars outside and that makes them nervous. So thinking through spaces, there's also an agency in our state who have a family justice center for their main office, but also keeps a small satellite office that people can get services at so that they're able to not, um, not have that contact if they choose not to. Someone mentioned finding ways to notice what we have in common. That's a really, a really good thing. We all, are, we all are grounded in our common humanity, and that's something I know Tracy Wright at NC Casa did an amazing webinar called Grounding in Humanity on um, NC Casa's uh, YouTube page, you can see it, that really gets into grounding in our humanity and how one of the best ways we can ground in that shared and common humanity is by understanding some of the ways that um, our experiences are similar and understanding a lot of the ways where they're different. Um, someone says, I'm in court every week and I know that the other victims in court are watching how I respond to my clients. So, um, so that they'll know that I treat everyone with respect, no matter who they are, right? So making sure you're very respectful to everyone. Sometimes that being respectful to everyone is going to require us to do some internal work on some of our implicit bias we might not be aware of. Um, so, so making sure that you're checking yourself, making sure you're open to feedback can be something. It can be very scary for a survivor to have to give us feedback, but something that we said maybe um, didn't land the way we wanted it to land because of a cultural or historical or, an, you know, maybe they're LGBTQ and something that we said was insensitive and we didn't even think it would be. We weren't trying to be, but sometimes receiving that feedback and redirecting accordingly can be really helpful and can build safety and trust so that they don't feel like they're just there to check a box on your diversity picture. We want them to know that the services we want to provide are genuinely there because we care about you as a survivor and we're here to support all survivors in our community, even when that means we have to do a little extra work to learn. Someone says, knowledge and understanding of diversity, collaborating with resources. Yes, so here's another thing, build partnerships with culturally specific um, and LGBTQ agencies in your community. Find out where they are and do collaborative partnerships with them. Collaborate with them on a group or an event and um, listen to their leadership, empower their leadership. Um, that's another really wonderful way. So I wanna revisit this um, slide we did earlier about someone experiencing trauma over the lifespan. In specific to um, historical and cultural trauma, I want to acknowledge that living under discrimination, that experiencing discrimination on a regular basis, I know that some of you have probably heard the phrase microaggression, and that's where someone might say something that, um, that has like a, an undertone of of an insult, even though they might be saying it in a way that's meant to sound 
um, me meant to sound positive. Um, and so living under that every day, living in fear that you might get harassed, let's say that you, um, on your way home, um, I know specifically um, LGBTQ or trans women experience really high rates of street harassment. And so let's say that every time you walk home, people are, are shouting and harassing you and saying unkind things. And maybe once or twice when you were walking home, they physically assaulted you. And so now you walk down the street and every time someone shouts or cat calls or harasses you, you feel this fear come up in you because you're not sure if it's going to be connected to assault. Or let's say that, um, you know, you are, um, you have a family member who um, died during what was presented as a routine traffic stop and were shot. Um, then maybe when you see police, you don't feel a sense of safety. You feel fear. Um, and and you're not sure who to reach out to when you're experiencing fear because you know what you've seen happen to your family member. Um, so these are examples of how just living under oppression uh, and constant harassment can be a form of trauma and can cause all those trauma responses. And so remembering that when someone comes through your door, in addition to any other traumas they may have experienced, if they have a marginalized identity or come from a community that's been marginalized from access to services, um, they're going to be having some specific cultural and historical trauma in their lives around those experiences. So we're going to want to be thoughtful around that. We're going to make sure we're doing our internal work around that. Um, let me get my screen where I can see well. Um, and so the picture that came to mind when I was thinking about cultural um, responsivity and some specific considerations around that. Um, I was looking at this picture and I was reminded that everybody in this one lane is in a traffic jam. Everything is slower. There's a checkpoint. There's more things you have to do to try to maintain your safety. There's more things you have to worry about as you navigate the world. The people in the other lane don't even realize um, these things that the people in the other lane are having to do. They might see it and say, wow, man, they've got some traffic over there, but they may not even notice because they're able to drive along as if nothing's going on because um, maybe they're from the, um, you know, maybe they have fewer marginalized identities, right? So some specific things that might come up in that regard in your rape crisis work is again, relationship with and presence of law enforcement will be received differently by black and brown survivors and we mentioned earlier some of the challenges around family justice centers with that. Another thing might be that fear of deportation might impact someone's desire to report or even to come in and ask for your services. There may be such intense fear that even coming to your agency puts them at risk of interacting with someone who's going to report them and, and that they're, um, they could be deported. These are big things that could be big fears, and especially when we look at sexual violence that happens in the context of human trafficking. This is something that traffickers often exploit um, with those survivors, letting them know, if you come forward, I'll make sure you get deported. I'll, I'll tell them. Um, someone um, might be afraid of being outed, and that might impact someone's willingness to come forward or to report or to receive your services. And so this could be the case if someone is trans or queer, if they're sex working, and if they're underage, if an underage person who is drinking ends up being assaulted, they might be afraid of coming forward because what if people find out? And that can be something that can keep people from coming to your agency. So finding ways to let people know we're not outing you, we're not reporting you without your consent except under mandated reporting requirements. Um, we want to create a safe of a, of a space for you as we can. And a lot of times, just lack of faith that they're going to receive competent services can deter people from reaching out to, um, to let's see. Um, yeah, so that can keep them from reaching out to your agency. So, for example, if you live in a really, really rural agency and you are LGBTQ and you don't know anybody in your community that's LGBTQ and you're afraid to come forward because you're not sure if you can get sensitive um training, you might just not reach out because you haven't really had great experiences in your community of being supported in a way that didn't feel bad. Um, so um, remembering that that lack of faith they'll receive competent services can deter people from reaching out. So how do we build trust? 
how do we help them? And that's um, one of those things around building collaborative partnerships um, with agencies that are already working with these, these um, populations can be really beneficial. So today, <laughs> we cannot have a webinar about trauma and not acknowledge that right now, there's a whole lot going on uh, in this country. <laughs> And we know from our studies of trauma and these other webinars that we've done and a lot of the conversation we've had today, that trauma can be reactivated in trauma survivors by uncertainty, by fear, by invalidation or feeling like you're being told your needs don't matter or aren't real, by oppression, by discrimination, by isolation, which in the middle of the pandemic, a lot of us are feeling more isolated anyway by confusion and by helplessness. A lot of times when we're experiencing the initial traumas, there's a lot of confusion and helplessness. And so in the future, when we experience confusion or helplessness again, it can activate some of those old wounds, some of those old ways of being. And we know that right now, this list, there's probably more things. If you want to add in the chat box, something else you can think of that reactivates trauma. But we know right now, all of these things on these lists are in abundance. If you open your social media feed, if you turn on the news, there's a lot of uncertainty and fear and, and invalidation. So we've been dealing with a global pandemic. We have friends and members of our community who've been sick or even died. I know that um, our NC CASA staff have all had friends. Um, most, many of us have had friends who have died um, from COVID. Some of us have friends who are long haulers and are still dealing with some of those mystery after effects. Most of us also have less access right now to the things that helped us feel supported, which might have been regular social time with your friends, having friends over for game night or movie night or dinner, being able to hug your friends. I don't know if I'm the only, I can't be the only one who misses hugs so bad. I think the, as someone asked me, a couple of months ago, what would you do if the pandemic ended today? And I'm like, I would drive around the country hugging everybody that I've missed hugging for the last eight months. Boy, do I miss hugs. Um, we've been watching the ways that our media and that our leaders are talking about all sorts of social issues that impact real people and survivors in our communities. We're hearing the way they're talking about race and the way they talk about asylum seekers and the way they talk about immigrants. And we might even be hearing people we care about, people we've known in our communities for years, say things that are just mortifying and deeply hurtful because the things are just so polarized right now. And that means that today, we're all carrying a lot of extra emotional weight. And we're looking at a lot of uncertainty and fear. And it's going to be a rough few weeks, no matter what happens. And this is going to impact the survivors that we work with. Um, I know that a lot of our friends who are mental health clinicians have been freeing up a lot of time in their schedules to have open slots for emergency sessions with, with clients who need it, right? We've talked about trauma. And we've talked about how when you've experienced trauma, experiencing those feelings, again, can reactivate your trauma responses in your body, right? Survivors are definitely feeling some of that again, having their perceptions invalidated, feeling like they can't trust people that they should be able to trust, not being, not feeling like they're entirely sure what's real and what's not anymore. So um, survivors are definitely feeling this. So I want to open it up to you in the chat box. To start with, what do we think survivors need from us and from our agencies right now in this moment, and what would help survivors feel safer over the coming weeks. Who wants to share something in the chat box? I mean, this is a tricky one. I think a lot of us have had the um, the experience of wanting to offer someone reassurance. Everything's going to be okay, but I'm not I'm not sure that, that that's what we can say with integrity right now. But 
we can offer them reassurance that we're going to be here, right? We're going to be here for you. Someone says believability, sense of self in a safe space. Yes, this is a safe space. Hey, there may be a lot going on right now that doesn't feel safe. But, but our agency, our building, our phone lines, we're, we're going to do the best we can to be a safe space for you in the midst of a whole lot of turmoil. Having trust that we're still here to listen and support them, that's right. You know, I, I, again, being transparent, trustworthiness and transparency. I can't tell you everything's going to be okay or that it's not going to be really chaotic for a little bit, but we're going to be here. Our agency's still here. We're still going to be doing the best we can to provide you with safety and for us to support each other. Someone says they do a support group and they have a private page and we meet every week via Zoom, but we check in on each other throughout the week as well. I love that. So I know that one of the things when we do hotlines, a lot of times we offer a follow-up check-in, whether it's hotline or support group, would you like a check-in? And so that might be something to where if you don't already offer that, if you do offer it, be more diligent about it. If you don't offer it, maybe ask, hey, um, it sounds like things are a little bit intense right now. Would it be okay if I, um, with you, if I checked in with you next Monday just to see how you're doing? Um, great. Is it okay if I leave a voicemail or if I call and don't get an answer? You know, so like follow up for, for, um, for checking in a little more often. What are some other things that we think survivors might need from us right now? Ooh, telling the truth even when it's hard, yes. And that might be the truth about um, the capacity of systems right now, um, being honest with them about what's going on and how it might impact the, the, um, the systems that they have to, that they might be engaging with as survivors. Some reassurance, yes. Reassurance that we're walking with them, they're not alone. And so maybe we can pivot a little bit um, because each of us shows up in this work as ourselves. And when we come here, we do our best to be objective, but we also don't do anyone any favors when we pretend like we're objective and fine all the time, even when we're not. And the reality is a lot of us are, if we're not primary survivors of trauma, we've experienced some vicarious trauma through our work. We're living in that same uncertainty that they're living in right now. We're definitely all feeling that ourselves while we do that work. And between the things we've experienced and the things we've heard about or been witness to, um, I'm kind of reminded we need to be taking care of ourselves and each other as well right now. And so obviously in this work, this is stressful work that even when things aren't as uh, uncertain in the world as they've been these last eight months and as they especially are right now, um, even before this work had high turnover and high burnout, right? So um, we want what we're doing to be sustainable. And so sometimes that means we need to get clarity on how we want to show up in this work. And most importantly, we need to be able to take care of ourselves because we also, just like the survivors we work with, we also deserve rest and safety. And just by virtue of being here, of existing, you deserve gentleness and care and ease in your body. And so I wanna shift focus as we wind down this, um, this webinar today and ask you, how, how are we gonna take care of ourselves and each other in the coming weeks? How's your staff gonna make sure that what you're doing with each other is sustainable? And what can we do to feel less alone and to ease some of the fear? So do, does anyone want to share in the chat box something that you're personally doing for yourself or maybe a way that you're connecting with friends or with your coworkers um, to, to take care of yourself and each other in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, someone mentioned something that I'm pretty sure they were referring to work with survivors, that it's the same for us as staff, that we don't have all the answers, but we'll help work it out. So remembering that your staff, your other coworkers are going to be there to kind of also, in addition to helping survivors work out and figure out what's going on, that we're going to have to be there and be flexible and responsive with each other as we work out what we're doing. I know one of my um, coworkers texted me last night 
to ask what I'm going to be doing today to take care of myself. And, uh, you know, kind of like, do you need an extra check-in? If you're a supervisor, if you're supervising staff, how are you supporting your staff um, this coming week? But also, how are, who are you reaching out to for support? Someone mentioned taking time out, going for walks to recenter. Definitely. Definitely. So that's something, taking Sundays to do whatever I want, whatever that might be. Yes. Discussing our concerns and COVID-related stress. Exactly. Just like survivors need space to share some of their fears, um, having us have space to share our concerns as professionals and our COVID-related stress can be really helpful. Someone mentioned that they're going to be spending Thanksgiving with their kids in Missouri. Haven't done that in 13 years. I hope that goes so well. That sounds lovely. And also kind of I would be a little bit nervous. That's something exciting and different. Oh, someone mentioned buddy checks. Um, buddy checks. Yes, it might be scary to see people you haven't been around in 13 years thinking of how you're going to take care of yourself with all that would be, uh, would be interesting. But I like the idea of buddy checks. How can you do that with the people that you work with, with your, um, with your supervisees? And then if you are a supervisor or you are a leader or executive director, who's your support system? And then just winding it down again. Um, oh, yes, COVID scares me. My kids love me. Yes, that makes sense that traveling and all of that during COVID can be a little different. Um, so kind of winding it down tonight, election night, we got a lot going on, y'all. I'm probably not going to get any answers tonight from, from the estimates I've seen. But last thing as we close, what are you going to do tonight to take care of yourself, to feel less alone and to ease any fears you might be having? You don't have to answer in the chat box if you don't want, but I want you to think about that. If you don't have um, a little bit of a safety plan for tonight for how you're going to take care of yourself, if you start to feel overwhelmed, go ahead and, and think through that. What am I going to do tonight? Let's say I'm watching the news and I start to feel a rising sense of anxiety or panic. What am I going to do? And someone said, cut the news off or the TV off. Um, don't don't doom scroll. I don't know if anyone else has a bad habit of doom scrolling. Sometimes I'm a doom scroller. I don't mean to. Someone says they have a support group at five and a Disney movie after that. No TV. Someone's going to disconnect. Petting my dog and snuggling all night with her. It calms my breathing and anxiety. Someone mentioned deep breathing, relax, change the channel. Yes. So that's just good that y'all are thinking about this because we want to make sure, again, we got to take care of ourselves because we want to be sustainable in this work. If we're going to reassure survivors that, you know, we can't we can't tell you everything's going to be okay, but we can tell you we're going to still be here, then that means we kind of need to take care of ourselves to keep ourselves sustainable in this work. So um, I want to make you uh, give you something to laugh at. Um, so memes are another thing that make me laugh when I need good self-care. I don't know if anyone else has been an emotional parkour master lately. Um, am I the only one who's been like this doing mastering feelings parkour? Um, I hope I'm not the only one. But anyway, um, that was a little thing that I saw on social media that made me laugh. And here's another one. This is me. It's probably some of you too, because a lot of us, it's so hard to receive a compliment. <laughs> It's so hard to receive a compliment when someone says something nice about you, when they start bragging on the work you do, when they start telling you how awesome you are to be there for survivors, doing this work in your communities, holding space, standing in the gap for survivors when so many other people aren't. Um, I want to tell you right now, eat the flower if you want it, but the flower is that you are amazing and that your dedication, especially the fact that you're here on election day, says so much about um, who you are and um, that I think your communities are really blessed to have you in them. And that's it. There's my contact info. Email me if you want. And I hope y'all have a really, really um, find some ways to have a really restful evening in the moments that you need it. Take care of yourself, y'all. <laughs>